So now I'd like to introduce the next uh, set of speakers, really covering challenges in endoscopic management, uh, early detection, and surgical approaches uh, for uh, localized and locally advanced esophageal cancer. Uh, and we'll, we have uh, uh, Pari Shah uh, from uh, GI, Daniela Malena uh, from our uh, thoracic surgery group, uh, Thomas Rainer from uh, radiology, uh, and Hans Gerdes, and then followed by a case discussion by Ryan Moy. So I just want to try to stay on time, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Pari. Please come up. Thank you. So uh, good morning. Um, so I also want to congratulate Dr. Jinjigi on a wonderful program and Dr. Ilson on your award, and thank you for having me today. So we're going to shift gears just a little bit here, but the principle is quite similar to what Dr. Strong was just speaking about. We're going to talk about screening and non-surgical approaches to Barrett's esophagus and premalignant esophageal conditions. So Barrett's esophagus, like uh, Dr. Tang mentioned this morning, is really a histologic diagnosis of a change from normal squamous epithelium to the specialized intestinal metaplasia that we see in the distal esophagus. And there is a strong association between Barrett's esophagus and acid reflux disease. About 10 to 15 percent of people with acid reflux disease, or GERD, will ultimately develop Barrett's esophagus in their lifetime. And so we do advise all patients with acid reflux disease to undergo EGD for screening of Barrett's esophagus. We say once in your lifetime uh, you should have an endoscopy to evaluate for this. And in patients with Barrett's esophagus, Laura Tang showed us a really nice slide earlier this morning that a small subset of patients with Barrett's will progress to low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, and ultimately to carcinoma. And so we do advise all patients with Barrett's esophagus should undergo EGD every three years for surveillance in an effort to detect these dysplastic changes at an early stage to allow for uh, endoscopic evaluation and treatment. So we've developed a number of new technologies to help us in our evaluation and uh, identification of both Barrett's esophagus and dysplastic disease within that area. So we're now using high definition white light endoscopy in all patients. We're using these uh, technologies like narrow band imaging to enhance our ability to detect abnormal cells and abnormal tissue. We're using a number of different techniques with biopsy, confocal laser endomicroscopy, and optical coherence tomography. All of these uh, technologies just, uh, just really help us to identify the dysplastic areas uh, prior to uh, our intervention or during our endoscopy. Endoscopic ultrasound has really become the hallmark for T staging of, of, of uh, esophageal cancer. And as we know, the overall accuracy of EUS ranges in the series that have been published, but probably the accuracy is about 75% in all comers. We think that EUS is more accurate in the later stages in T3 and T4 disease, but with high frequency EUS probes, we can achieve a 75% to 80% accuracy in early stage disease, but yet there's a gap here. And so endoscopic resection of early cancer can really help both with diagnosis, a diagnostic procedure, as well as a staging procedure. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. So we went over the statistics this morning uh, with Dr. Tang in a really nice way. Um, but just briefly, 1% of all new cancer cases are going to be esophageal cancer cases. 80% of them will be in men. Most of these are over the age of 50. And still, we see that the five-year survival is only 17.5%. So this indicates why we're trying to uh, identify these cases at an early stage and intervene before they become invasive disease. This is from the uh, recent AJCC uh, cancer staging, and we're looking really to focus on those patients who have uh, early disease, so high-grade dysplasia before they become uh, in, uh, uh, carcinoma, those with T1A or T1 mucosal disease, and uh, ultimately those with T1B or uh, a superficial submucosal involvement. So this, again, highlights that survival in patients with early disease is significantly better than those with later disease. And so again, we're trying to identify those patients at an early stage. So the important thing about identifying which patients are, are uh, amenable to endoscopic or local intervention, local therapy, is really to figure out what are the predictors of lymph node metastases in early stage esophageal cancer. So this is a study from 2008 looking at a mix of esophageal squamous cell cancer as well as esophageal adenocarcinoma, which shows that those patients with uh, um, mucosal disease, T1M or T1A uh, limited disease, 
um, had 0% lymph node metastases. And those patients with uh, submucosal involvement, or T1B uh, cancer, had about 30% chance of lymph node metastasis. And so this is where we really try to identify uh, those patients who are amenable to endoscopic therapy versus those that should be offered more invasive treatment. Uh, lymphovascular invasion was another high-risk factor. About 40% of patients with lymphovascular invasion had lymph node metastasis, and poor differentiation had about 35% of uh, lymph node metastasis. So this is a follow-up study looking at that same concept. This study was done in all patients with adenocarcinoma, uh, surgical cases that were uh, T1A or T1B. And what this study shows is that one, the presence of one factor increases your risk of lymph node metastasis to 25%. Two factors increases it to 33%. And all three poor factors uh, increases your risk to 50% of lymph node metastasis. And again, those are the presence of lymphovascular invasion in your cancer, poor differentiation, or invasion into the submucosa that's greater than 500 microns. So I finally wanted to highlight that outcomes after surgery for early cancer are much better in those that are limited to the mucosa or submucosa, and we can group these together to the superficial submucosa. Deeper submucosal invasion has a poorer outcome, and similarly, those with lymph node uh, presence have a poorer outcome. So. Uh, Esophageal uh, cancer for early stage disease was in, originally treated quite um, often with esophagectomy. This is a single center study of all patients with T1 cancers. Uh, there are 75 patients here. But what we can see is that the five year survival rate is 80%, but overall complications were reported in about 30% of patients. Additionally, after esophagectomy, a number of symptoms can develop in patients difficulty swallowing, feel, feeling bloated. Uh, nausea, and some of these symptoms can persist even as far as 12 months after surgery. So for these reasons, we are now shifting towards endoscopic therapy in patients with early esophageal cancer who have low risk features for lymph node metastases. And identifying those patients is really important. So patients who have uh, adenocarcinoma limited to mucosal invasion or superficial submucosal invasion, candidates with no lymphovascular invasion, well or moderate differentiation, and less than three centimeters, all of these patients have a low risk of lymph node metastases and are appropriate for endoscopic treatment. We have a number of endoscopic therapies that are available now to offer for treatment. Uh, so we use a combination of endoscopic ablation, ablative therapies, and endoscopic resection. Techniques like endoscopic mucosal resection or endoscopic submucosal dissection, where we can uh, lift out or cut out the entire tumor from inside the esophagus using our endoscopes. I'll speak briefly about ablation. Over time, we've used a number of different therapies, photodynamic therapy, radiofrequency ablation, cryotherapy, argon plasma coagulation. All of these therapies are effectively used to apply heat to the inside lining of the esophagus to essentially eradicate or burn any of the abnormal areas. But we've found over time that radiofrequency ablation really has taken the um, major uh, uh, role in this, uh, in this procedure. And so this is just a schematic showing the technique. We pass a catheter into the lower esophagus at the GE junction. We position the catheter uh, uh, in uh, the area of the Barrett's esophagus with the dysplastic areas. We inflate a balloon to allow contact between the heat uh, probe and the surrounding esophageal mucosa, and we can apply heat to the inside lining where we can ablate all of the dysplastic cells and ultimately the intestinal metaplasia as well. So this study, uh, looking at 127 patients who were randomized to either ablation versus a sham procedure, came out in 2009. Uh, multiple centers were involved. And it really shows how successful uh, radiofrequency ablation is at eradicating dysplasia and Barrett's esophagus. 80% of patients with high-grade dysplasia had their um, entire dysplastic area completely eradicated uh, with radiofrequency ablation. 80% of patients with low-grade dysplasia had complete eradication of their dysplastic cells. And about 80% of patients with Barrett's esophagus uh, with, had all of their Barrett's uh, eradicated with this as well, uh, which is really important because of the underlying mucosal uh, defect. In long-term follow-up, uh, overall, only 3% of patients had progression of their dysplasia. Only 1% of those in the treatment group eventually progressed to cancer, and there were few adverse events associated with this procedure. This is well tolerated uh, by these patients. In a subsequent study, high-grade dysplasia only recurred in about 4% of patients at three years. So this is really um, safe and effective at treating uh, dysplastic areas like high-grade dysplasia.
So endoscopic resection is uh, really the um, therapy that we now go to for treatment of uh, early uh, esophageal cancers that we describe. And first, um, we'll talk about endoscopic mucosal resection. This was originally described in Japan in 1985 uh, for the treatment of gastric cancer, but rapidly applied to uh, the treatment of esophageal cancer as well. And in this technique, we can inject a little bit of saline to lift the mucosa, the abnormal mucosa, uh, up off the submucosa. We can capture the abnormal area in a snare or a rubber band, and we can subsequently apply heat to resect the entire area of abnormality. Um, so this is a case that we've uh, performed here that shows the segment of Barrett's esophagus seen endoscopically. You can see the area where a nodule is uh, uh, identified under narrowband imaging. It highlights that area of abnormality. And we went on to place a rubber band around the base of all of that abnormal tissue and cut out the entire lesions uh, successfully. Uh, this slide, courtesy of Dr. Tang, who we heard from earlier, uh, shows that all of the um, cancer is limited to the uh, lamina propria and the superficial mucosa. The uh, lateral margins and the deep margin are completely clear of cancer, and this patient's cancer was uh, cured completely endoscopically. So long-term efficacy and safety has been looked at, and this really, this landmark trial looked at 1,000 patients in Europe who were treated for uh, mucosal adenocarcinomas. And most of these patients had well-differentiated tumor, they all had mucosal uh, lesions. This study shows that 96% had complete remission of their dysplastic tissue. There were only a few complications, uh, and only 42 cases that had failed endoscopic resection, 4%, uh, a subset of them that went on to get esophagectomy. Of those that had endoscopic treatment, about 14% had subsequent metachronous lesions on uh, follow-up uh, studies, and these were also largely treated endoscopically. So we've also looked at our results here at MSK, and we also see about a 75% complete eradication of high-grade dysplasia and carcinoma in our patients. So endoscopic mucosal resection has also been supplemented with this new resection technique that's um, initially, again, first developed in Japan and has really spread worldwide called endoscopic submucosal dissection, where we use a technique to uh, identify the cancer, mark the, the margins, and then subsequently a knife to sort of dissect the entire tumor off the deeper layers of uh, submucosa to resect the tumor in one piece in an end block resection, uh, which provides a number of advantages. So the absolute indications uh, and relative indications are the same as that those that we use for EMR and described here. Early cancers limited to the mucosa or to the superficial submucosa and uh, um, can be removed with uh, ESD. So this is a nice case that was performed here at MSK by our colleague Makoto Nishimura. Uh, a superficial esophageal cancer that you can see in the distal esophagus. The edges are marked with a heat probe and he subsequently uses a knife to, slightly, to slowly dissect off the tumor off the deeper layers to leave this clean margin uh, completely uh, behind with no uh, uh, subsequent tissue. This was um, resected and blocked and submitted to the pathologist in one specimen and uh, in follow-up imaging this patient had no uh, residual cancer. So ESD has been looked at for long-term uh, outcomes as well. 100 cases of ESD for esophageal squamous cell cancer was reported in this study in 2005. And you can see here the median size of resection was almost three centimeters, larger than what we normally do, and block with EMR. And block resection was 95%, which is really great. Local recurrence was 0%. And overall, the number of complications was low with zero perforations in this series. Uh, this uh, follow-up series looking at EMR versus ESD highlights these differences in the techniques. Um, the mean size in the ESD patients in this study was 2.4 centimeters, while the EMR uh, was 1.15 centimeters. The end block resection was 95% successful with ESD and only 70% with EMR. And uh, the um, complication rate was low in both. The local recurrence rate was low in both. So both of these techniques are highly safe and effective for the treatment of soft gel cancer and uh, offer different advantages depending on the size and location of the tumor. So long-term survival is important to us, uh, assess if, uh, and compare endoscopic treatment versus surgical uh, treatment. And what we can see here is that patients who are treated endoscopically, the middle lines, really have no difference in long-term survival uh, than those patients who undergo esophagectomy. And as time has gone on, we can also see that the number of patients undergoing endoscopic resection are increasing, and that trend extends out beyond 2008. So in conclusion, survival with early esophageal cancer is really dependent on complete tumor excision uh, prior to lymph node and distant metastasis. Uh, this is very similar to the concept we spoke about with Dr. Strong and gastric cancer. 
In lesions with high-risk features, EMR or ESD can be used to provide diagnostic uh, uh, information about the actual stage of the tumor. But patients with high-risk features found on pathology should be offered subsequent treatment, uh, um, such as surgery. Patients with low-risk lesions, however, have excellent outcomes with endoscopic therapy alone. An ablation of the residual dysplastic or metaplastic areas after EMR or ESD is critical to prevent recurrence of uh, dysplasia or metachronous lesions. Thank you.